the New York Knickerbockers, the Cleveland Browns of the NBA, the absolute laughingstock of the league, an ailing franchise has been a failure for two decades, a team so mired in ineptitude that their fan base lived in a world where optimism doesn't exist. Well, maybe delusion, but not optimism. From bad trades to bad drafts to questionable free agent pickups, the next cycle of bad decisions and bad play can be summed up with three words. James freaking Dolan. But there has been a seismic shift in the garden. The Knicks are not only watchable, but they are competitive. While no one has them pegged as title contenders, this turnaround cannot be ignored. What's happening YouTube captives and welcome to Dan on Sports. Today we'll be discussing the resurgence of the New York Knicks. We'll discuss much simpler times when they were actually good, aka the uh, 70s and the 90s. We'll then discuss the exact point where the Knicks turned into a dumpster fire and who was responsible. It's not really a spoiler alert to say who it was, we all know who it was. We will finally discuss what sparked the turnaround and if this is sustainable and if there is continued hope for the future. Drop it. A lot of you may be young and you weren't around for this, but Knicks weren't always a slow-moving, cataclysmic event. There were times when they were actually pretty good. Not just that, they were title contenders. Don't laugh, they were champions. Now, none of us were alive for their championship days, and you probably have to read up on it in the Bible, but the Knicks of the 70s were a special team. Following the run of 100 straight titles by the Celtics, which was mildly interrupted in 67 by the 76ers, the 1970 Knicks team, led by coach Red Holzman, were able to beat the Los Angeles Lakers in seven games. With the likes of Walt Clyde Frazier and Willis Reed, the Knicks started the season 23-1 and en route to a 60-22 and record and the top seed in the East. Everyone will remember Willis Reed walking to the court to play with a severe thigh injury and scoring the team's first two buckets, but it was Frazier who carried them to that Game 7 win with 36 points, 7 rebounds, and 19 freaking assists, still one of the greatest Game 7 performances in NBA history. The Knicks made another trip to the Finals in 72, but the Lakers got a measure of revenge, beating the Knicks in 5. In 73, you can tack on another title for the Knicks, again beating the Lakers. This time in five. This was the team Phil Jackson was on when he won a title with the Knicks, for those who didn't know. More on Phil and the Knicks later. Home oh man, much more on Phil and the Knicks later. But this Knicks team was loaded with future Hall of Famers. Walt Clyde Frazier, Willis Reed, Dave DeBusher, Earl the Pearl Monroe, Jerry Lucas were part of this roster. The Knicks of the 80s were nothing to write home about. But thanks to some sleight of hand from the late NBA commissioner, David Stern, the Knicks landed arguably their greatest player, Patrick Ewing. The younger generation wasn't around to see the physical and talented Knicks teams of the 90s, so failure is all they know. This team was special though. But they were the prime example of wrong place, wrong time. If you were a top team in the 90s, it was great and all. You had to take a backseat to this fellow who played in Chicago. I heard he was pretty good or something. Pat Riley, fresh off winning four championships and making many other finals appearances in LA, joined the Knicks in 91 and gave them instant credibility. Those Knicks teams were bruisers and were the poster boys for 90s NBA. When people tell you that the NBA was super physical in the 90s, they're talking about teams like the Pistons of the early 90s and the New York Knicks all through the 90s. The cast around Patrick Ewing resembled NFL linebackers more than NBA players, and you paid a price for taking it to the hoop. I mean, Charles Oakley was basically a sentient wrecking ball with arms and legs, and so was his counterpart, the late great Anthony Mason. Mason endeared himself to fans with his physical play and his iconic haircut designs. Fearless shooters like John Starks and Hubert Davis, as well as defensive-minded point guards like Doc Rivers, yeah, he played before he coached, 
and Derek Harper made up a physical backcourt. This team was built to win a championship, but unfortunately for them, Jordan was as unstoppable as a drag route in Madden. They have had multiple playoff runs ended by MJ. Their best team in my opinion was the 93 team. They were the top seed in the East with a 60 and 22 record and hosted Chicago in the Eastern Conference Finals. With stories of Jordan gambling addiction getting out and the Knicks taking a 2-0 series lead, it really looked like their time was now, or their time was then. But champions tend to have another gear, and Chicago won the next four games in the series, including Game 5, the infamous Charles Smith game. Ironically, the Knicks' two trips to the finals came right after a Jordan retirement. He's retired multiple times, guys. Unfortunately for them, they came up short both times. In 94, the Knicks lost to the Rockets in a series that most will remember because of a certain car chase that interrupted Game 5's telecast. Knicks lost in 7 to Hakeem Olajuwon and the Houston Rockets. They had a 3-2 lead and were close to winning the title when John Starks shot him out of the series. In 99, the strike shortened season, the Knicks were the 8th seed with some grit and determination and a 4 point play by Larry Johnson found themselves in the finals. That team had sharp shooting Allen Houston and choke artist Latrell Sprewell. I joke about that, but Sprewell was my favorite player on that particular squad and carried them in that final game of the series. Ewing was dealing with injuries and was in and out of the playoff run. They lost in 5 to a historically good Spurs team with David Robinson and a young Tim Duncan terrorizing the paint. This would mark the end of any legit playoff success for the Knicks. Oh boy, here we go. It takes a series of things going wrong for a competitive team to turn into a dumpster fire. It all starts with a head piece of trash. I mean, it all starts with the top. James Dolan is hardly a basketball mind, but he's an owner and that's pretty much understood. Most owners aren't. However, the best owners know how to delegate and not meddle. James Dolan turned meddling into an art form. MSG Properties was owned by Cablevision, and this included ownership of the New York Knicks basketball team and the New York Rangers hockey team. Cablevision trust fund baby James Dolan assumed some control with managing the sports teams in 1999. He wasted no time meddling when he had a hand in the firing of Knicks GM Ernie Grunfeld mid-season as the Knicks were struggling in a strike-shortened year. Sweet karma came when that same Knicks team that Grunfeld helped build went to the NBA Finals right after he got fired. Like I said earlier, that was the end of the successes. Then came the failures. Mismanagement created salary cap woes for the team. It started with overpaying Allen Houston, who was an excellent player but not worth a six-year, $100 million contract, which he got in 2001. They were the only team willing to pay him that much. Their last playoff trip for a long time would be in the 2002-2003 season. Then it would be folly after folly, which ironically started with the hiring of Knicks fans' favorite president of basketball operations, Isaiah Thomas, in 2003. Isaiah Thomas' tenure would be defined by terrible trades and salary cap mismanagement. He became the target of teams who needed some cap relief from their underperforming players with big fat contracts and knew they could put one over Thomas and the Knicks, which caused extreme frustration with Knicks fans. In 2004, Thomas traded Antonio McDice and two first round picks among other things to Phoenix for an over the hill Penny Hardaway and Stephon Marbury. Those big contracts got the ball rolling down the steep cliff into salary cap hell. A few months later, he traded for Jamal Crawford and Jerome Williams and gave up four players with expiring contracts, more big contracts to tack onto the Knicks payroll. In 2005, the Knicks overpaid for Jerome James, giving him a five-year, $30 million contract. He plays nowhere near the level deserving of that contract at the time. This one was classic. In 2005, the Knicks traded a first-round pick for Eddie Curry who was the biggest of question marks due to a heart condition. He was also quite doughy and out of shape and completely underperformed. Safe to say, the Bulls won that trade. In 2006, the Knicks traded for Steve Francis, aka Stevie Franchise or uh, Stevie Franchise Killer, 
was far from a franchise player at this point. They trade Penny's now expiring contract, which would have given them some cap relief. Instead, they have another albatross hanging over them. See, the criticism with Thomas is that he would load up on big contracts for over the hill players at the same position with the same skill set. At this point, the Knicks had a number of point guards or pointless guards who don't pass. During this time, of course, the Knicks were losing and went through a number of coaches. From Don Chaney to Lenny Wilkins to Larry Brown, all coaches were tasked with making chicken salad out of chicken shit. In 2006, Isaiah Thomas fired Larry Brown, who had previously led the 76ers to a finals appearance and won the whole damn thing with the Detroit Pistons in 2004. Who did Thomas replace him with, you ask? Well, that answer is simple. He replaced him with himself. In 2006, Thomas traded for Jalen Rose, who was pretty much cooked at this time. He later releases him instead of trading him for some value. But the way he's been trading, maybe that's for the best. Mercifully, Dolan stripped Thomas of his front office capabilities right after foolishly signing him to a multi-year contract. Donnie Walsh was hired as the team's new team president and later that year fired Isaiah Thomas. To add to more woes and embarrassment, the Knicks were even horrendous off the court. In 2007, the court ruled in favor of a former executive who sued the team after being fired for complaining about sexual harassment from Isaiah Thomas. Dolan and MSG had to pay $11 million in the settlement. Now let's talk about the decision. There was a belief that LeBron wanted to play for the Knicks. I do not believe that to be a foregone conclusion, but the Knicks didn't help themselves when they sat with LeBron. Instead of telling him their vision and what they're looking to do to be a successful franchise, they gave him a Sopranos presentation and tried to illustrate how cool it is to live in New York. Nothing like out of touch execs trying to deal with millennials. Signing Donnie Walsh was already paying dividends as he put together a well-balanced roster which included Danilo Gallinari, Raymond Felton, and the newly acquired Amari Stoudemire. The Stoudemire pickup was questionable due to his knee issues, but after whiffing on LeBron, they had to make the move. The Knicks were playing very well that year and competing in the East, Amari proved to be a great pickup initially. Then came the Melo trade. Melo wanted to be a Nick, and Melo was not going to re-sign with the Nuggets. Conventional wisdom says, just wait until the offseason and you'll be able to sign Melo. Walsh was playing it smart and working to avoid overpaying for that in the trade. But instead, everyone's favorite meddler steps in to give Denver everything they wanted and more to make this trade happen. As the trade deadline was coming, some rash decisions were made. The Knicks get Carmelo Anthony, Chauncey Billups, Ronaldo Balkman, Anthony Carter, and Sheldon Williams. The Nuggets get Danilo Gallinari, Raymond Felton, Wilson Chandler, Timothy Mozgov, a first round draft pick, along with two future second round picks, effectively killing any chemistry or future they built up. They finished the year 42 and 40 and were swept by the Celtics in the first round. The following year after another lockout, the 2012 Knicks went 36 and 30, botched insanity, and got eliminated in five games by the Heat. In 2013, the Knicks won 54 games and took the Atlantic Division. In the playoffs, they bumped an aging Celtics team in six and then were eliminated in six by the Pacers. That was the end of the winning. They went back to their losing ways the next few years. So, I caught an unintentional omission in post. While swimming in a pool of Knicks mistakes, one major mistake spilled out. Ooh, and it was a big one. In 2013, the Knicks traded the popular Steve Novak, Quentin Richardson, Marcus Camby, the 2016 first round pick, the 2014 and 2017 second round picks, and a couple of their firstborn to the Raptors for Andrea Bargnani. This move set a team lacking draft assets and cap space even further back, if you could imagine. Okay, now Phil Jackson, master of the shape with three angles. The man that was supposed to bring the Knicks back to prominence. Let's talk about his body of work during this run. 
March 2014, Dolan hires Phil Jackson to save this sinking ship. It starts off oh so promising when Steve Kerr turns down their offer and makes the best decision of his life and coaches the Golden State Warriors. The rest, as they say, is history. Nick settled for Derek Fisher. One of Phil's first moves is to re-sign Carmelo Anthony for another five years. Not only that, but they include a no-trade clause. They are already putting themselves in a financial bind. The Knicks start the season running the old archaic triangle offense that only works when you have a Jordan or a Kobe to bail you out. Melo's not one of them. The triangle's failing, the Knicks are losing games, they finish with a franchise-worst 17-65 and 65 record. Naturally, this cursed team did not get the first pick, so no Carl Anthony Towns for you. They end up drafting Chris Stapps Porzingis, and Knicks fans lose their shit. Some even cry. The Knicks are still losing, but are much improved, and Porzingis is impressing. But Jackson still fires Derek Fisher for resisting the triangle. Kurt Rambis is the interim coach for the rest of the year. They finish 32-50. and 50. Oh, and then they hire Jeff Hornacek as a new head coach for like a cup of coffee. Then, then, with Donovan Mitchell on the board, Phil Jackson drafts Frank freaking Nilakina. Reason, Mitchell doesn't fit the triangle. Mitchell doesn't fit the triangle. Jackson's wise decisions then include the signing of Joakim Noah for way more than he should have had. Noah underperforms, of course. Jackson's last mistake may have been when he said he would be open to trading Porzingis. And this was before Porzingis was disgruntled. Jackson is gone by the next month, taking a big chunk of money and giving the Knicks nothing in return. This may be rock bottom for New York. I mean, can you imagine it getting any worse than this? The Knicks are a joke, MSG is a joke, I mean still calling it the basketball mecca in 2020 is like still calling the Dallas Cowboys America's team. Something has to change. The Knicks fire Steve Mills who followed Phil's performance with safe moves to stabilize the franchise. On March 2nd, 2020, Leon Rose was named the president of the New York Knicks. He is reaping the benefits of the moves of his predecessor. Steve Mills and Scott Perry were responsible for shipping Melo and getting some short-term contracts in return and a second-round pick that became Mitchell Robinson. They also traded the disgruntled and injured Porzingis to Dallas for draft picks and also freed up a ton of cap space for two max contracts. In Knicks fans' heads, they thought it would be for Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. As we all know, that didn't work out, but they used the cap space to sign smaller short-term contracts which included Julius Randle. The Knicks now have cap space and draft capital and can remain flexible in their continued rebuild. After the previous year, you'd think the Knicks would finally land a number one pick in the draft, right? But as always, the lottery was unkind to them, and they landed a third pick, missing out on Zion Williamson and Ja Moran. They ended up with Williamson's teammate in Duke, RJ Barrett. While Zion is looking like a perennial doughboy, Morant is the legit star of this class but Barrett is coming into his own as well. In 2020, the Knicks hired Tom Thibodeau as head coach. He's turned them into a more defensive-minded team and has unlocked something in Julius Randle. He is now a legitimate star in this league. In Thib's first year, the Knicks finished as the fourth seed and hosted a playoff series. They did fall to the Atlanta Hawks in five, but the pieces are there to build a brighter future. The Knicks are a much more attractive team in free agency than they have been in a long time. They were able to sign Kemba Walker and acquire Evan Fournier in a sign and trade with the Celtics. With Thibs at the helm, a much more improved Julius Randle, and a lot of excellent pieces in place, the Knicks rebuild is ahead of schedule. Is this resurgence sustainable? Only time will tell. History has told us that the Knicks have a one-off good year and then three or four of them where they fall flat on their faces. But those other teams did not have the cap flexibility or the draft capital or the front office competence that they do now. Should be fun to watch. And that is today's discussion on the New York Knicks and their return to relevance.
What do you guys think of the state of this team? Do you think they'll keep this going? Do you think the bottom will fall out? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. But um, only if you're feeling the content. I'm not forcing you or anything. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. I'll be looking to discuss more football next. We'll take a look at that time when the NFC won 13 straight Super Bowls. What the hell happened to the AFC at that time? Until then, you're dismissed. Peace.